Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Darkest Dungeon here on the Hitmon channel. I'm Jacob. And I'm Noah. And last time, uh, we just started out, we went through the first quest after getting Reynold and Dismiss over here to the Hamlet. And in this episode, we're going to be embarking, uh, we're going to be embarking, uh, on more stuff. And, well, explaining a lot more stuff. Uh, first thing here. A strange glow at the farmstead. The comet's impact is felt here in the hamlet. The great impact toppled gravestones and kicked up a cloud of ice greens. A cloud of dust that covered the entire region. And it finally settled in the eerie miasma was seen, was seen to spread from the mill. It distorted the rules of time and space far beyond imagining. Venture to the miller's farm to see what has been done. So, this is another DLC thing that's now been unlocked for us. The farmstead. One of the DLC areas in the game. And... For me, a special one, uh, because it was Noah, as you know. Uh, I did a D and D campaign a while back where the ultimate enemy was a bunch of crystals that came from a comet that came from an asteroid that came from space because asteroids, uh, and that was partly inspired by this stuff. Oh, oh, that's actually really cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I completely went in a left <laughs> field with that one. Uh, for the, I feel like we've talked about it on previous YouTube projects, but for those who were not aware, um, that is the one. I mean, technically, I've done another D and D campaign with uh, Jacob, but it was a mm. long time ago, and yeah. we barely got anywhere. Um. But this one was like a standalone campaign that he did, and I based my entire character around Bobbert, the little robot <laughs> from the Amazing World of Gumball. And ended up accidentally uh, producing the most story progress of any party member. Yeah, and, and I ultimately was the driving force of and figuring out how to defeat the final battle by jumping into a pond. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. D&D uh, is fun. Anyway, so... Yeah. Uh, before we could... also, there was also a point where I pretended to be a rug. Oh, right, yeah. In the... a forest. <laughs> <laughs> because right, yeah, I could... didn't know we were in a forest. Yeah. I guess some context for you guys in the audience. Uh, they were outside uh, a goblin den, uh, and we're debating how, and we're like try hiding in various places, waiting for the goblins to come out so they could ambush them or what, or just sneak past them. I can't remember specifically what the plan was. And Noah, thinking that we they were in a house. Uh, used a pelt from earlier on in the game to try and disguise himself as a fur rug in the middle of a forest. It did not go well. <laughs> no, it did not. Anyway. Oh, man. So, before we can embark on anything, as you can see, one of our four party members is off relieving some stress in, I forget which, it's been like a week, so I forgot which thing I put Echo Land in. But yeah, they're off healing stress, so we need to have someone replace them. So, off to the stagecoach. And it is at this point, I would like to introduce two things. First, I guess, a new character class, because he's here. To fight the Abyss, one must know it. This is the Occultist. Uh, they specialize in... Fighting Eldritch stuff as well as some debuffs and one of the big, one of the most powerful healing spells in the game. Essentially, the Occultist is the alternative healer, main healer to the Vestal class. Uh, now, as you can see here, his name is Archard. Achard. I don't know how to pronounce things in general. I apologize to anyone with this name. Because I just butchered it. Uh, but, it doesn't have to be. We can rename characters. And so, going forward, after our first four, I would like 
my plan is to rename like give each character their own like name each character so noah what should we name our cultists our I, was, cultist? I was wondering if you were gonna ask me about this um well hang on there's i have a movie to talk about today <laughs> so i'm gonna look up the characters in that movie uh, just to remind myself of the names. Um, uh, I so I'm a so we're gonna name this guy Emmett. E M M E T T. Uh, named after Killian Murphy's character in A Quiet Place Part Two. All I right. wanted to put this on the podcast, but our three, our next three episodes of the podcast are kind of stuffed. Uh, uh, so um, now is a good a time as any, um, because I have very strong thoughts on A Quiet Place Part Two. <laughs> um, Great heroes can be found. So, I, so I must preface this by saying I absolutely love A Quiet Place 1. Um, I Now, I've, I've never been... Communion with the I, I keep saying I've never been much of a horror fan. I'm definitely becoming more of a horror fan over the past <laughs> year or so. Um, uh, and... But A Quiet Place was one of the earliest, was one of the first, it, it was one of the first new horror movies I saw. I actually saw the first A Quiet Place at a drive-in theater um, paired with, of all movies, Deadpool 2 and Rampage. <laughs> that was an amazing triple feature. <laughs> um... But, uh, yeah, um, and I didn't, I, I really didn't, you know, expect to get anything out of it. Uh, A Quiet Place 1 is so wonderfully inventive, um, and I, you know, um, I am always very impressed with movies that manage to tell such a compelling story with so few words. Wally's another great example, of course. Um, at least like the first half of Wally. Um, but um, A Quiet Place, just the whole, the way the story is told visually um, and, and what they, how they play with what little sound they have and um just the the slow build of fear throughout the film as a result of the quietness is so unlike any other horror film i've seen and then they made a sequel <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> that's always a good transition well here so the ending of A Quiet Place Part 1 absolutely sets it up for a sequel. I, I won't deny that. But when a sequel was confirmed, I was very hesitant from the get-go. Um, because I was like, okay, how are you going to live up to that first movie? <laughs> as far as inventiveness. Um, and I, this is going to be a very hot take because people are loving a quiet place part two i mean it's definitely the biggest box office success since everything shut down um because you know stuff is coming back now and um and uh also, if you ever like interrupt me to make like game progress feel okay okay yeah sorry uh real quick i'm go 
Real quick, uh, I am going to just do this ruins mission real quick. It's a medium level mission, so we'll introduce a new mechanic here. Firewood and camping. So, for, for missions that are length longer than short, uh, you get firewood. This allows you to sit at in what and this allows you to during any room in so as long as it's cleared out uh, within a dungeon, sit down and camp. Sit down and camp. This consumes various amounts of food depending on how long you camp. Uh, allows you to use this row of camping skills to camp skills and has the additional benefit and has standard benefits of healing stress and health as well as what other ver additional benefits you get from these skills down here so so to make sure we can utilize that we're going to take a decent amount of food although do that anyway we're going to take two shovels just because i'm paranoid after the last dungeon that was walls everywhere and yeah all right get any uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, and just feel free to interrupt me at any time, because I'm I'm probably going to be uh, talking about this for an extended period of time, probably <laughs> the, throughout the episode. All right. Uh, so, um, yeah, no, people are loving A Quiet Place Part 2. It, <sighs> let me look up what it has on Rotten Tomatoes right now, but it is, you know, by far the biggest box office uh, success since, you know, COVID happened. It currently has a 91% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, uh, just barely, uh, below the 96% its predecessor has. Um, and I think that this movie's first scene sums it up pretty well my like a lot of my issues with the film now i should preface this i think the first scene in this movie is the best scene in the movie but it's also super unnecessary because the first scene in this sequel takes place before the first movie uh -huh. it so it shows the al the aliens arriving on Earth and killing a bunch of people. Um, and you know it's pure chaos. Um, I think it's shot and directed very well. Um, it's a very tense scene, but it we didn't really need that backstory. Like the back like the. The first movie gives you all you need to know about the aliens is that, like, they are attracted to any sound and will kill people who make sound. And that's that's all you need to know. You don't need to necessarily see the beginning of the apocalypse with these aliens because, you know, the, the first movie starts a little ways into the apocalypse. You, you see the two parents with their kids, and one of the kids gets killed after activating a loud spaceship toy. Um, and then it jumps forward almost a year, or over a year, actually. Um, and them just, you know, trying to live out their lives. Um, in quiet. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, no, this first scene is really exciting, but it it's not necessary. And I feel like that could sum up this entire movie. It's exciting, but it's not necessary. Um because there there's a lot there are a lot of really good moments in this movie, but all in all, I just feel like it's not a movie that has a reason to exist. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, the only other purpose of this opening scene 
is to set up our new male lead, played by Killian Murphy, Emmett, who we named our occultist after. Um, and, boy, Emmett doesn't need to be in this movie. <laughs> like, well, okay, here's the... Th so, spoilers for both A Quiet Place movies in this uh, video. So, sorry for uh, spoilers. Um... But, um, and I would, like, e even with these spoilers, I highly recommend checking out that first A Quiet Place movie. Again, it's super, at a time where I was not very into horror, it, you know, it impressed me with its filmmaking very much. Um, but in that first movie, um, John Krasinski's character, um, sacrifices himself to save his kids. Uh, so it's just the two kids and the the baby that is born during a quiet place and uh the mother played by Emily Blunt. Uh, real quick. Uh, uh yeah. real quick. Uh new mechanic introduced. Uh sometimes when scout uh when you enter a brew you have a chance of scouting, uh, which will reveal some amount of the dungeon going forward, like in all directions. Uh revealing enemies, curios, and so on. Sometimes when you scout something, it will reveal a secret door. Which allows... Secret doors allow you to access secret rooms, which contain chests that, if you have a key... Like, regardless if you have a key, contain treasure. And if you have a key, contain a lot of treasure. So, real quick, we're going to walk up to where the secret doors sit on the map. We're going to press W to enter the room. Use our key. And gain some very valuable treasures. Uh, first, these puzzling tra tra trapezohedrons, uh, which are worth a lot of money. And then this lovely treasure, Dismas's head. Don't question the fact that Dismas is in the party and his head is also in the bag. <laughs> I mean, I would argue that's a reference to Walt Disney's frozen head. <laughs> um. But yeah, it's a very powerful item that Mac then drastically increases his increases your damage, but also lowers your HP, and increases the amount of stress that you gain. So, uh, for comedy, we're going to give that to Dismas for this mission. <laughs> now, Dismas, don't lose your head over this. <laughs> yep, exactly. And then we'll see how that goes afterwards. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, so... Yeah, John Krasinski's character dies in the first A Quiet Place movie. So Killian Murphy's character, Emmett, is essentially the a, a replacement character for him. Um, he the the main plot of A Quiet Place Part Two. They like they they basically while escaping the aliens. Uh, the family finds Killian Murphy's character, who apparently he was a good friend of theirs before the apocalypse, and the only hint you get of that is in the brief moments you see of him at a baseball game in the opening scene with them. That's the only development this relationship gets. Um, but they find him in this bunker, um, and he's got a radio... And uh, over the radio, the kids hear music for the first time, because, uh, you know, obviously, or I guess not, maybe not for the first time, because they were alive for a while before the world went to shit, but uh, it's been the first time in a while that they've heard me. Um, and it's the song, Somewhere Beyond the Sea, Somewhere Waiting for Me. You know what, I'm, mm -hmm. what song I'm right now it's in finding Nemo. yeah uh, and uh so yeah they hear that song and uh the daughter who um for those who haven't seen the movie the daughter is deaf and um she wears a hearing aid and throughout the course of the first movie she discovers that um the hearing aid feedback from the hearing aid is actually the weakness of the aliens um the, like the, when they get near the hearing aid feedback uh is so strong that it like 
makes their heads open up, uh, allowing you to shoot them. Uh, yeah. It, it's a really cool, really cool, um, like, way to, you know, give those, uh, monsters weakness. Like, it, it's, it, I, I think it's super creative. Um, and so, um, the, the girl, uh, deduces that, I forget how she figures it out, but she figures out that this radio broadcast is coming from some village with people and that the song is not they're not just playing the song because it's a good song but because it's a hint to find them and send them help so she wants to go and send them help because she knows how to stop these aliens um singular strike and Except, like, well, yeah. Um, and so, Cillian Murphy's character, basically Emily Blunt, the mom, sends him to get the daughter back. Um, but then when he finds her, he ends up deciding to help her find this village. Um, and that's the main, so... Uh, the movie cuts between, uh, you know, a couple different plots. And that's another big issue I have with this movie. Um, the, the first movie, you know, apart from the fact that there's aliens, um, is very grounded. And there, it, like, you know, it takes its time. There's not a whole lot going on, but, you know, that's part of the story like it works for the world that this movie is building um again it, it's a movie called a quiet place mm -hmm. so not a lot of action um this movie called a quiet place part two um kind of throws out that all out the window <laughs> and has like three different plots going on basically there's the main plot with the daughter and killian murphy and then like the mom has to get more oxygen tanks for the baby because they the 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 way they keep the baby quiet is they basically built it like a little casket with an oxygen tank and mask connected to it so they put the oxygen mask on the baby to give it oxygen and then close it in the box so that you know it doesn't make noise um and then like so she they're running low on ox on the oxygen tanks and so she has to go get more um and then um Oh, wow. Sorry, I'm interrupting myself for a second because apparently um, Doki Doki Literature Club Plus got announced? Oh? Yeah. Um, physical releases on PS4, PS5, and Switch. Oh. Huh. Um, and I, I guess some... There's some new there's like special like pre-order goodies and stuff um and i'm guessing by the plus name there's gonna be more to the game itself well, presumably yeah uh especially it better because, be if he's charging if, he's, if they're charging money for what was a free game <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's 30 bucks so it's not like full priced but mm -hmm. still. uh but that's interesting yeah right? i look forward to seeing what that's about um, anyway, back to A Quiet Place Part 2. Um, and here's the thing. Because Killian, because, now I say Killian Murphy is unnecessary to this story. And that is because, like, I say he becomes the new male lead. He essentially becomes the new lead. Um, you know, or, well, a strong case could be argued that the daughter is the lead in this, which I'm okay with. Um, but he is definitely, like, second lead. Um, and that leads me to a big, 
another big complaint I about, have about this movie, Emily Blunt doesn't get to do anything interesting in this movie. And she, you know, the ending is lit. The ending of the first movie is literally her cocking a shotgun, getting ready to kill some aliens. And yeah, she does get to, you know, fight some aliens, but she's not the driving force of the story anymore. Like she, she doesn't. She gets com She gets pretty much sidelined. Like her plot is a B plot. For sure, when you know the way the, the the first one ends, it like he should be the main character of this movie. She has a top billing after all. <laughs> but no, she doesn't really get to do much interesting. Um, uh. Um, what are they gonna say? Um, yeah, um, also, here's a weird thing. Um, a lot of the Killian Murphy stuff, particularly, there's a part where they encounter, like, on their way to the village, they encounter a group of bad dudes uh -huh. uh, who you know try to take the daughter um with them it, and it's not explicitly stated what they want to do with her but it's you know heavily implied uh -huh. uh, and that same shit happens in 28 days later another great horror film starring <laughs> murphy so and it feels like a lot of it, like, his casting in the movie doesn't help dissuade the fact that it feels like 28 Days Later at some points. <laughs> um, which, yeah, 28 Days Later is a great movie, but you didn't have to make your A Quiet Place sequel more like 28 Days Later. Um... Uh, and so, like, yeah, the, the, the son in this movie gets even less to do than, um, Emily Blunt. He's pretty much, the, the son is just a burden throughout the entire movie, because, like, where he, you know, he's hot, he's staying in the bunker. This is the C plot, basically. Uh -huh. he, while his mom is going off to get more oxygen tanks, he is sitting in the bunker, uh, keeping tabs on the baby, um, making sure the baby. I, I don't think it's ever. I don't remember if it's ever established what gender the baby is. So I'm just calling it the baby. Um, uh, real quick. Uh, two new mechanics introduced here. Uh, the first big one is afflictions. Uh, when, as mentioned last time, uh, when someone's when a character's stress level reaches a hundred or more, uh, they become they can become afflicted. This is a variety of afflictions. In this case, we have Emmett who got the abusive affliction, and these cause a variety of events to trigger while in battle and while walking around. Uh, depending on the infliction, the afflicted character can, will, will generally like cause everyone else in the party to just slowly gain stress over time for various contextual reasons. Uh, but they can also uh, act on their own in battle, refuse to be healed, attack other party members, and steal stuff, and other things that are not fun to deal with. And the second mechanic, the sec basically once a character gets inflicted, it's kind of a race against time to finish the quest before everyone else either dies or gets afflicted as well. Uh, the second new mechanic, this thing, 
this thing, uh, the Shambler's Altar, uh, sacrifice to fire, sacrifice of fire is the gate to ruin, place a torch if you crave the void. Uh, so for these, we can use a torch and summon a boss that generally will kick the shit out of you. Which we're not doing right now, because I feel like living. <laughs> I just want to establish yeah. what those are for, since I will, at some point, be using one of those. And then immediately regretting it the entire time. Because the Shambler fight sucks. Yeah. Anyway. Um, Continue. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the sun is just a burden throughout the entire movie. Uh, there's actually, before everyone kind of goes off to their own plots, um... Uh, and the the family is like running, you know, they're they're running away from their home, uh, and they they come across the area where this bunker is. Um, in one of the like most gruesome scenes in this film, um, the son gets his leg caught in a bear trap. Ugh. Um, yeah, it's it's brutal. Uh, this, it is PG-13, so it's not, like, mm. super, like, he doesn't lose the leg or anything, but it, there's quite a bit of blood, um, and, yeah, it's, it is brutal, uh, to watch, and, you know, obviously, he screams in pain, because he can't control himself at that point, because he, you know, got his leg caught in a bear trap. Uh, and that, you know, attracts the aliens, so they quickly run off to the bunker while he is just in pain. Um, and then, like, when he's, you know, asked to watch his baby brother or sister, I don't remember, um, while the mom goes out to get more oxygen tanks, um, uh, he like there there's a point where you know the alien starts to come near the bunker and um he starts hyperventilating so he like takes the the oxygen mask away from the baby and starts taking it for himself mm -hmm. uh, the baby does not die in this movie thing okay. um you now the baby survives uh i was like actually worried the baby might die when he took the oxygen mask but now the the mom gets back with more oxygen in 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 the nick of time and also the the emily blunt's coolest moment is is like activating sprinklers to mess with the aliens hearing um that that's cool um and this movie's ending is really cool too because they do like sort of a parallel editing thing where you see um the the um the daughter and killian murphy finally get to um the uh the the radio station at the village um and she turns off the somewhere beyond the sea broadcast to um you know broadcast the feedback from her hearing it um just as an alien, just as one of the aliens is coming into the radio uh, station, um, and just as an alien is breaking through the door of the bunker. And they still have that radio in the bunker. So they do this cool thing where it's a parallel editing where um, the daughter and the son are both, like, you know, bringing that, you know, speaker closer to are both bringing speakers with the hearing aid feedback closer to the aliens and getting ready to uh kill them and you know killing them you know in parallel editing that that ending is really cool and the beginning of this movie is really cool too if unnecessary <laughs> but like the this film just all in all it like my best way to sum it up is that like this movie wasn't necessary they didn't have enough creative ideas to make it worth making and it's just it it is completely it's completely different from its predecessor and not in a good way 
uh, in my opinion. And yet they're making a spinoff, not, <laughs> not even a direct sequel, which I think they are probably planning as well. But they re but they announced a spinoff first. I don't know what the how they're doing with that. Just the, the first movie's so good. Leave it alone. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, you've been sitting here for a while. I've <laughs> so got right. something to say. Yes. Uh, so, we have been a few that we can't introduce throughout this, throughout this dungeon. One that I have yet to acknowledge is the journal pages mechanic. So, throughout your explorations of the various dungeons, you can find these journal entries, which are snippets of journal, which are snippets of journal, of longer journals, uh, that give you, that give you some back. Give you word that tell the story of various characters in the background or backstory of the game. I think you will be able to find them until you run out of journal entries to find. And I kind of like to just show them off as we as we collect them. So I'm going to leave the first of an entry: the Plackets of Fates. Our purpose was to desecrate the animalistic shrines and thus disperse the swine folk. But soon we came across an artifact. We'll get to this, the swine folk later. Uh, this was far beyond the crude fetishes crafted by the pigmen. It looked as if an, it looked as if obsidian had been grown and twisted into a dark symbol of worship. It cradled a pulsing red orb, glowing with malevolent light. Kutchberg, Bully, and, and, and I hesitated, but thrice damned Mizir, driven by crazed impulses, thrust his torch in a hidden recipe. In a, in a hidden receptacle and thus sealed her fate. So this is in reference to the Shambler altars that we saw earlier, conveniently finding them in the same mission that this is, that we find this. Uh, this, the Blackest Fates, uh, tells the story of a party that attempts to fight the Shambler and then gets their asses handed to them. Here's turn number three. The assault was overwhelming. With Cuthbert slain and his bowling fell, I, I was driven by rage. I leapt forward and drove my axe into the creature's many eyes. Purple ichor splashed into my face, and my very soul shook as it bellowed. The only thing I can recall after that was falling swiftly into blackness. All right. And with that, let's end the quest. The shifted corridors and folk walls of our ancestry are beginning to feel familiar. Now, because we're going to see good room, we'll be able to get a lot of extra money from that, which is good because things are expensive. <laughs> And we got some level ups and some quirks. Reynold has gained irrepressible exism, which gives him a 5% of virtue chance. So, what that means is when someone gets to 100 stress or more, more often than not they will become afflicted, but occasionally they can become virtuous, which is the exact opposite of being afflicted, meaning that they will help, meaning that they will help reduce, which is passively reduce the stress of allies in battle, can sometimes heal it, sometimes heal it. Sometimes heal allies in battle. Uh, they gain buffs, and just generally, it's really handy when characters get vir go virtuous. So that's good to see. Good chance of that. Heal swim, which gives this most an increased accuracy. Hard noggin, which is a stun increased stun resistance, and thin blooded, which is lower blight resistance. All right. and consequence will invariably have their dreadful reunion. A maddening wine, intolerable. Clouds of mosquitoes and other less identifiable pests continue to descend upon the hamlet with maddening persistence. Illness and irritation ab Ill illness and irritation abound. New card cordial quest is available. So. <laughs> so. Uh, we've unlocked a few things here, but first I will point out what that referred to, and that's the Courtyard, one of the other DLC areas in the game. So the Courtyard works very differently from every other area in the game, for reasons that we'll get to when we start a Courtyard mission. But, <clears throat> but now, we should get to start a Courtyard mission, but I don't think we'll do that yet. Also, we've unlocked, we've unlocked missions in The Weald, which is a foresty wilderness area 
and more stuff to do in the ruins. Little farmstead remains. So, uh, the courtyard is part of the Crimson Curse DLC, which it, the Crimson Curse DLC, which adds a variety of new mechanics to the game, uh, and generally makes the game harder to deal with. And we'll get we'll get to that as as we go. Uh, first. I did not mean to click on that. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> the, the hitbox on the butcher stick is a little wonky, apparently. First, let's go to the stagecoach, stagecoach and see who's new. Conveniently, we have four completely new character classes. So, apparently, we have a jester, a leper, a man at arms, and a grave robber. We'll grab them all. Thanks to those with a keen eye. Say things. <laughs> this man understands that adversity and existence are one and the same. He will be laughing still at the end. All right. Now that I've seen them all, oh, let's go through them. First, the Jester, a very, very useful class to have in any part, in basically any party. Uh, for one dominant reason. Well, they're generally pretty useful as they have some nice abilities that cause bleeding and they ha and the classes and most of the classes abilities function around they have some nice buffing abilities and most of the classes abilities revolve around preparing for preparing for using the move finale as which is a high damage which is a high damaging move the high damaging move that many of the class abilities will give buffs to specifically so Anyway, the reason why they're very valuable is this move right here, Inspiring Tune, which heals stress, and it is one of very few moves that do so, and is the most effective of them at that. So he is very valuable, especially towards the late game, where stress is an even bigger thing than it already is. So, what shall we name him? Well, I was gonna suggest naming him after basically the Joker of Dong and Rampa, but he relieves stress, so that can't be. <laughs> um, and that is my. Well, Liam's not here. I'm not. No, I'm still gonna adhere myself to the one per stream rule. Oh, I haven't told you about that. You, you have not told me. What is this one per stream rule? So, uh, this is. Apart from actual Danganronpa streams, because we do those and, you know, the game, you know, often bombards me with stuff to complain about. <laughs> but, um, in non-Danganronpa streams, I have set a rule for myself so that Liam doesn't stop being my friend. <laughs> um, uh, to only, uh, only make... Uh, comments about how I hate Danganronpa once per stream. <laughs> uh, um, so, um, oh gosh, uh, Jester, um, oh, you know what? Uh, shout out to uh, one of my favorite streamers who also helps me reveal stress. Ironically, also plays Dongan Rampa. Uh, uh, let's go with. Uh, can you put in underscores? Yes. Okay, clown underscore depot, like Home Depot. All right. Yeah. Hello, Clown Depot. Welcome to the team. Nice. His quirks are in positive end, gifted and healer's gift, which increases healing, which increases healing skills while camping and. Healing received, which is nice to have. And for Snyder Kirk, he has Sphere of Beast, which means he is worse when fighting enemies of the Beast category. And Thin Blooded, which means lower blight resistance. Alright, wait, keep him on screen for a sec. Yep. Wait, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I just need to screenshot this so I can tweet it at him later. <laughs> um, see, see, see if he reacts to it. <laughs> uh, anyway. Next, we have... A leper. Uh, lepers are... They're popular in meme runs. 
lepers in the dun in the darkest dungeon community. Uh, but generally speaking, how lepers work is that they tend to do a lot of damage, but also miss a lot. So they're so they're kind of high risk, high reward damage dealers. Ah. Wait. Ah. Uh. This this guy's quirks are stout, so more healing while camping. A uh, wheel tactician, which means he does more damage in the wheel, which we just unlocked, so that's convenient. And deviant taste is not allowed to visit the brothel for reasons best left to discretion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. And uh, with him being uh, a man who deals a lot of damage uh, but misses a lot, uh, let's name him Focus Blast. <laughs> I'm liking just the utter chaos in the naming of these characters. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's Emmett. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Emmett. You've got Reference. the normal name. It's the most normal. All right. Next, we got the Man at Arms, a character class that I was terrible at using correctly for the longest time until basically the very end of my first run of Darkest Dungeon. I was trying to figure out what the fuck he was supposed to be used for. <laughs> so uh, this class, is, one of this class's big things is this is this ability, the defender ability, which allows him to guard an ally, meaning that if a tar meaning that if an enemy targets another member, a specific whatever member of the party that he is guarding, uh, the damage will instead go to him instead. As a part of that, he gets a he gets a defense buff, which is the protection stat. As it's called in this game. And he doesn't have it. He doesn't have it currently, but he also has this ability that pairs really well with this. Where is it? No, Retribution, which activates a skill called. which activates a state called Repost, which allows him to count. like. perform counterattacks when hit by an enemy. So, a big strategy with him is to have him guard, like, some potentially, like, squishy. like, squishy or eas more easily killed enemy, like a healer or if we when we eventually get to the Manticrarian, we'll discuss them later. And then activate retribution so that whenever the so whenever the more vulnerable character gets attacked, the the attack suddenly goes to him, he takes less damage and then can smack the enemy right back. He also has some nice buffing skills and some general attack. Anyway. Alright. So he is known for his defender ability. Uh so for that re can you put in hashtags? Yes. All right. Hashtag save Daredevil. <laughs> I'm very glad I'm having you pick these names. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and his quirks. His quirks. Uh, his quirks are precise striker, which means he does more melee damage, which is convenient because all of his attacks are melee. And then. Oh god, how to pronounce this? Uh, Fengophobia? Whatever. Which means he is more stressed out if the torch is above 75. So when it's... So he gets really stressed out by being able to, I guess, see it clearly. I'm not sure what this phobia's name specifically comes from, but... Higher torch level means higher stress for him. Anyway. And then we got the Grave Robber, which I'm still not sure I know how to use correctly, but... <laughs> uh, so it's kind of hard for me to explain. Uh, at the very least, one big, basic strategy is like they're a somewhat range-based character, although they do have a convenient melee attack that, that ignores defense, which gets very convenient. Uh, they can shovel themselves around through the party, for, through with various abilities, throw knives, and one of the big things, uh, they can they can inflict blight on enemies, and then ha they also and then pair that with an ability that does extra damage against blighted enemies. So they can poison someone and then stab them even more because they're poisoned. Their quirks are zoophobia, which means they're more stressed out when fighting these type of enemies. Wars explorer. Which means they take, not, which means they have an increased chance of causing a scouting event to occur while in the Warrens, and Night Owl, which means they have 
speed bonus if the charge is really low. Uh, this one's for you. Um, just just add a second. J just add an E after that second C. There okay. you go. Go Ghost Baby from Luigi's Mansion. Ah, okay. Uh, in addition to in addition to those four characters, uh, we've also unlocked two new buildings: the guild. Make no mistake, we will face ever greater threats. Our soldiers must be ready. The guild allows you to take a character, let's say Reynold, and then and then either buy new abilities like Battle Heal, which is a which is a healing ability that Crusaders get. Or upgrade abilities once we unlock the ability to upgrade abilities. And we can at least reduce costs, so we may as well do that. This is very, this is, the guild is very handy for both making sure that your characters are doing as much damage or as much healing or as much whatever as possible. While also making, while also giving, the, giving you access to a large, large, like all of the characters' possible strategies. So, for example, I am going to unlock point blank shot and where is it? There we go, Duelist Advance on Dismiss. Which uh and since it's since it's also here we can slice, why not? Uh which allows a very good one of my favorite one of my preferred strategies when using the Highwayman. And once you've unlocked all the character once you've unlocked additional abilities past the initial four, you can swap them out by taking on them here. So we have point blank strat, which Act only works in the first slot and only attacks the first enemy row, but does a lot of, but does a lot of damage and then pushes and then pushes the highwayman back, which pairs nicely with the duelist advance, which activates three post and moves the highwayman one forward. So you can get, so with these abilities you can get the the highwayman into a nice two of point blank shot using point blank shot to do a lot of damage to the enemy in the front row. And then duelist advance to get them back into the front row, activate repost, and then get them ready to do it at a point blank shot. So nice, just a strategy that I enjoy. And then next, the blacksmith. The bellows blast once again. The forge stands ready to make weapons of war. The blacksmith allows you to upgrade his, upgrade a, upgrade a character's equipment. So everyone starts out with really low level equipment. But that can be upgraded to include standard to increase standard damage, crit chances, speeds, defenses, and so on, or HPs and so on. Sometimes I think some of them increase defense, but I think only for some classes. Although you have to unlock the ability to, <clears throat> you have to unlock the ability to be able to unlock higher level equipment. So, and then even once you've the blacksmith fully unlocked the character's highest possible level equipment is restricted by their resolve level. So, heroes of resolve level one can only access resolve level like level one equipment, and so on. So that'll be upgrade, and that'll be a priority in the future that I'll probably forget about because I am sometimes an idiot. Is in the hey, hey, hey! Yep, you may be you, you may be an idiot, but you're not stupid. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the protection hey, stones are actually pretty useful. Hardly. That's it. The two items for sale right now are the Sickening Satchel, which is a Grave Robber only item. Conveniently, we have a Grave Robber now, so we could potentially use that if we wanted to, if I wanted to buy it. Uh, which allows them to do more damage versus blighted enemies, and then the Protection Stone, which increases defense but lowers speed. Both are very nice items. But I don't think I'll buy them because, uh, because we have not a ton of money. And I am a cheap ass motherfucker. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna you guys from there, so just so there's not tags on them because I am weird like that. And then send Emmett in to reduce the stress in the cluster. This will also remove his affliction. It is possible, I believe, to remove afflictions while on a quest, but it is very hard because it requires reducing your character stress all the way down to zero, and when it's already at a hundred, and is already just increasing at a naturally higher rate because of their affliction, it's pretty challenging to do. Uh, everyone else is not 
great stress wise, but not terrible either. So I think anyone essentially could be used with any battle. But I would like to show off some characters. So I'm gonna bring in Focus Blast, uh, Clown Depot. Uh, where is that? Uh, uh, hashtag Save Daredevil. <laughs> And because I refuse to go in about a healer, we're still bringing in Griffin <laughs> for whatever the next battle will be. Uh, oh god, I'm gonna be laughing basically every time we go out to battle, aren't we? <laughs> um, I'm gonna see what's going to go to unlock. Inspiring tune on Griffin, and then a quick inspiring tune on Griffin. Uh, he's in the finale, but so it doesn't matter. Let's. Hey, Jacob, have you seen Fanta Have you seen the Fantastic Beasts movies? I have not. Oh, okay. Um, are you at all familiar with the actor Dan Fogler? Uh, not by name, maybe by stuff. Uh, well, he was in Fantastic Beasts. Well, obviously, <laughs> but I haven't seen Fantastic Beasts, so. Um, did I show you the movie Barely Lethal? You've talked about it a lot, but you haven't showed it to me yet. Okay, I, I should at some point. I, I fucking love that movie. Um, he plays a teacher in that. No. Uh, here, I'll give you a picture. It, um, because I'm pretty sure I've heard, like, YouTubers who have reacted to Barely Lethal describe him as this. Uh, Walmart brand Jack Black. <laughs> That's what he looks like. Um, this guy was just cast as Francis Ford Coppola in the Paramount Plus TV series about the making of The Godfather, and I find <laughs> that very funny. Oh, that's funny. Okay. Well, uh, the next episode, we'll, we'll be going on a mission, but we will save that until the next episode. Actually, go through the image. Go, go through and say it. Uh, just gonna bring it to the damage anyway. As long as we stay God chance. Okay. <clears throat> so, in the next episode, we will be progressing to a new area this time. One of the three. So, we'll figure out which one of the three on the next episode of, on the next episode of Darkest Dungeon. I've been Jacob. I'm Noah. Peace. And adios.